Welcome to the Upper Room Sermon of the Week. For more information, go to URFellowship.com. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much history here, wonderful friends. Um, it's just great to be here. It is. Um, I don't know what else to say. Thank you for the flowers. Thank you for the sentiment. And um, I'm excited about his word today. It's a, it's a special word. The worship, the things that have been mentioned, that wonderful testimony by Mrs. Bennett. It speaks highly of just what the direction we're going. So, Amen. I'll hold it there for you. Well, good morning, everyone. I will tell you that... Uh, I'm very honored to be here, and uh, I am uh, I'm excited about what God wants to do today. I, um, uh, I feel like there's a car with its headlight, headlights on hitting me in the face, but I will, because I, I, I want to see, I like to see some eyes out there. Uh, I want to just uh, uh, tell you how much I appreciate the leadership here. Um, seeing Bruce come up and share, I... I feel like, you know, Bruce, you should, you should uh, tell a story that uh, I will never forget, that we were having an elders meeting, and we were trying to get really deep, you know, and decide, what is God doing? What's the most important thing that we need to do as a church? And uh, Bruce said, well, you know, I think we need to grow closer to, to Jesus, and uh, we kind of went, well, Sure, Bruce. I mean, <laughs> duh. You know, I mean, like we should all grow closer to Jesus. We had a discussion for another hour, and we ended up saying we need to grow closer to Jesus. And uh, there he is. So, uh, you know, appreciate. I, uh, there's certain things you think of because you have history, and so, you know, uh, I, when I see many of you, I do that. I want to tell you that uh, so that we clear up a few. Uh, possible distractions today. Back in December, just before Christmas, I had a stroke. Uh, unexpected. I had just uh, finished the book, and I was actually at Barnes & Nobles doing a book signing. Came home and was just rejoicing in what God had done, and uh, the room began to spin, and um, I thought I was having another bout of vertigo, only to realize a very slow onset of a stroke. And so for the next, I went to the hospital. For the next month, I was in St. Elizabeth's up in uh, uh, Youngstown. And I can tell you that um, you want to learn some things, go spend a month in the hospital. <laughs> man, oh, man. You know, uh, I, you know, thankful for all the care I got. But I would tell you that there were some long nights. There were some tough nights. There were some nights where I wondered if I would ever be myself again. And... Uh, it was on my left side, my left leg, left arm were most affected, and uh, since that time, you know, I'm walking and everything's working, it just isn't quite coordinated, so I'm left-handed, so that, that didn't help, but um, making progress there, and then about a month and a half ago, um, I got shingles, Anybody, who's had shingles in the room, let me see, God bless you all, we should have a support group, amen? Uh, I get shingles on the right side of my face, my head, my ear, my neck, and shoulder. The pain was off the charts. If it had been on the left side, see, I can't feel as much on the left side, it would be great. But uh, God has a sense of humor. Uh, you know, how ironic that I would write this book, God Knows Your Address. You know, it was like Cindy, uh, after my hospital stay, she said, God knows your room number. Uh, you know, so I've been through quite a bit, and um, at the end of the shingles, uh, my speech had been fine. I hadn't had any trouble with my, my language, my speech, my hearing, everything was great. But at the end of the shingles, I began to uh, slur some words, and uh, apparently that is a side effect of uh, the shingles and some of the medication they gave me. So I, I'm saying all these disclaimers, so first of all, you don't think that I'm, I'm, 
I had a little to drink this morning. I, I don't drink and I never have and I never will. But sometimes lately, God has humbled me. I sound like Foster Brooks, if you know who Foster Brooks was. But, uh, you know, so, so, you know, all of that going on. And then in the last week, my allergies have been terrible. I didn't have a voice yesterday. So I'm, I'm saying all that stuff to say, pick any distraction you want. But I have found that God's strength can be made perfect in weakness. And for this to be such a challenge for me to be here today, I really believe God has something for all of you to hear. And so you should understand that you know, my journey, uh, my time here at the upper room, we got married in 75, moved here in 1976, and we moved here to be a part of the upper room which was a Jesus People coffee house thing going on at uh, above Doc Street uh, Veterinary Clinic. And uh, it was the most antiseptic smelling Jesus People Center in the United States. Uh, and not only that, there were other smells that were acquired <laughs> on those hot summer nights as we were up there worshiping the Lord. But uh, a wonderful journey, good to be a part of something God was doing, what I still believe you are, and that is on the cutting edge of the Lord's presence here in the world. So, so as, I, as I experienced not just what I, I knew here, I began to realize that there was this, this mis, misunderstanding in my heart, this perception that wasn't quite right of how I viewed God. And... Um, and it may be for some of you, too, to realize this today. I, for, for years, I viewed God as pretty much um, waiting for me to mess up so that he could punish me. In other words, I didn't see him as this wonderful, loving God who just wanted to fill my life and bless me with all kinds of good things. Rather, I saw him as ready to judge me when I screwed up. And unfortunately, I gave him, gave him help at that. I, you know, was not a perfect person. And so as I lived my life, I, I, I was pretty hard on myself. And uh, the sad part is I have to say that I was harder on myself than God was. And I find that many of us as God's people tend to see him a little more judgmental than merciful. And the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that uh, God truly loves us. His plan, like how I said it in my book, I said it like this. I said, we need to begin to think of God differently. He is good and he really likes us. He is after us, not like a policeman with a warrant for our arrest, but he's like the prize patrol knocking on our door to give us the check. And, uh, you know, I... I began to consider the Lord much more like that than just that he's just waiting for me to mess up so that he can rub my nose in it, make me feel bad, and then I have to somehow work my way back into his favor. Instead, I now see him as a loving God. And when, when I came up with the title for this book, I have to tell you that uh, uh, most people, this is interesting, when I said, Oh, you wrote a book? Yeah, what's the title? I said, well, God Knows Your Address. And I go, oh, that's scary. You know, pe people would say, that scares me. That concerns me that God knows my address. So you mean God sees everything I've done? And I said, I didn't write it from that aspect. Now, if you need to repent, you repent, man. Get your heart right. But, but I wrote it from the aspect that God knows where, where we are all the time. He knows our circumstances he knows our situation. He knows what's going on. And he's, a, he's looking to do good things in our lives. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that he's trying to find out ways to bless us, show us his favor. He's not there ready to pounce on us should we mess up. Amen? I trust you agree with that. It's not easy for us because, uh, you know, sometimes we go through things and we go, Lord, do you, do you, do you see me down here? <laughs> You know, do you know what's going on? You know, do you realize what I'm going through? And do you even know where I am? You know, uh, I, if you've known the Lord for any length of time, you've probably had some moments where you said, Lord, do you realize 
How tough is this on me right now? You know, our dear school teacher that shared today, um, you know, you must have gone through times where you thought, Lord, do you, do you see the difficulty of my circumstances? And the Lord's answer is, I do. I do. And so he gives you a name, like sweetheart, you know. We could have given that to Monica too, I think, but that's uh, another story. But, uh, you, you know, we go through stuff. And we wonder, Lord, are you actually there? And sometimes it's physical. I mean, I could, uh, I could either be a victim <laughs> of life right now, or I could walk in the victory that Jesus has always had in my heart. I mean, I, you know, pick, pick a problem. But the truth is, what I'm walking through is not near what, uh, what others are going through who are wondering if they're going to live another week, let alone... Uh, you know, be able to walk. And so I just, uh, I look at life differently now, and, uh, and I'm thankful for it. So, so I began to realize God knows my address. He knows where I am. And when this all came about, I was reading a, a little tiny book called When God Winks at You. And uh, I had never heard, I just picked it, I think I picked it up at Ollie's. You know, you shop at Ollie's and they got all those books and I knew it was a Christian book, and I think I paid 75 cents. And, and, I, and I read this one story of this book, and I went, no, that is amazing. Well, I, wanna, I want my wife to come, and uh, she'll be my reader and, uh, and advisor today, but it's not the weird kind. So my, my reader and advisor, my dear wife Cindy, and I wanted to read this one story from this book called When God Winks at You. I am your advisor. Oh, yeah. See, that's it. Right. The incredible, unbelievable call. Uncertainty was pressing on Ken Gobb. Self-pity enshrouded him. What do you want with me, Lord? He silently demanded as the family's two silver-edged motor coaches traveled along I-75 somewhere near Dayton, Ohio. Ken's two sons were driving, keeping in touch with the CB radio. The rest of the family members were snoozing, reading, or lost in their own reverie. <clears throat> Let's stop him at that exit, radioed one son to the other. The Gob family was, traveling, uh, was a traveling ministry covering 50,000 miles a year, taking their family entertainment act into churches, schools, and on the back roads of America. Ken was feeling tired and unsatisfied. Where am I, Lord? He wondered about his purpose. Couldn't we serve you better by staying put, making a lot more money to support other ministries? Lost in thought, Ken was almost unaware that the family had decided to take a break and had, had pulled up into a small-town diner. You go ahead, he said to the others. I'm just going to stretch here and take a walk. He crossed through a gas station, walking past an empty phone booth. Suddenly, it began to ring. He stopped, looked around. We should, we should probably say, obviously, this occurred some years ago. Uh, yeah. Some of you young people are probably going, what's a phone booth? <laughs> Okay. It's true. <laughs> he stopped, looked around, and it kept ringing. He started to step away. He paused again. What if it's for the gas station attendant, he thought, looking around for someone who might be the target of some unknown caller. Maybe it's an emergency. That consideration caused him to stop into the booth. Hello? I have a person-to-person -person call here for Mr. Ken Gobb, said the operator. What? said Ken instinctively furring his brow and looking around for the candid camera TV crew that usually must be lurking somewhere. With a fake telephone operator calling an empty phone booth, trying to trap him looking silly by asking for him. Calling Ken Gobb, repeated the operator. You're crazy, he retorted, once again doing a 360-degree scan for the hidden camera. Less patiently, the operator asked, Is this Ken Gobb? I believe that's him, said another voice on the phone. A woman's voice. I have a person-to-person -person call for you, she reiterated, with the tone of a teacher scolding a child. I believe that's him, a voice on the phone. A woman's voice. Now Ken was really curious. If, there, if this were a setup, it was really a good job. <laughs> Go ahead, said the operator dismissively. Mr. Gobb, I saw you on a TV show, The 700 Club, said the woman with a quick nervousness. I'm Millie, I live in Harrisburg, and I remembered your name and wrote it in a letter I was writing, a suicide note. The woman began to cry. Ken was puzzled. You don't know me. 
but I'm desperate. I remembered you. And a phone number came into my mind to call you. Thank you so much for taking my call. This was no joke, concluded Ken. How did you get this number? He asked, shaking his head. I don't know. It just came into my mind while I was writing. Is this is your office? Is it in California? Ma'am, my office is in Yakima, Washington, but that's not where I am. Where are you, she sniffled. Millie, you called me. I'm in a phone booth at a gas station in Dayton. Oh, what are you doing there? (laughs) Answering the phone, he said with a chuckle, beginning to enjoy the experience. Can I talk with you? Yes, of course. For the next ten minutes they talked, Ken assured her that the Lord was watching over her, that her worries were only temporary, and that turning to God was the only answer. In him she would find peace, for after all, he had already led her to him. Saying goodbye, Ken took a seat on the stone wall by the gas station. For several moments, he contemplated the power of the good wink that he and Millie had just experienced. Was this a message of hope for her or a message of hope for me? He silently asked the Almighty. Across the asphalt driveway, he saw his wife and then the others emerging from the diner. Hey, Barb, he shouted, giddy with delight. Hey, God knows where I am. So many times over the years, Ken Gobb had revisited that personal life-changing God wink. I don't believe it, and it happened to me, he says. What are the astronomical odds that I would get that call from Millie? Time after time, he has reflected on how that experience not only stopped Millie from taking the irreversible step, but also how, from that day on, all of the uncertainty about his purpose in life was suddenly lifted from his shoulders. Ken also recalls that a few months later, after his family performed in Harrisburg, a smiling woman came up to him and said, Hi, I'm Millie. Funny, she looked pretty much as he imagined she would. There were a few subsequent telephone and letter communications, and then Ken lost touch. She she was no longer listed in the Harrisburg directories. She must have moved away. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe she'll call again sometime. What a story. I mean, I, I read that. You know, just to, which is to hear because we do the scripture soon. Um, uh, you know, I read that and I thought, man, come on. You know, you're walking at a, at a diner in the phone booth. The phone rings and you pick it up and they're asking for you. Uh, some of us might go, that's too big a coincidence. Well, yes, it is. I, again, I, I totally believe it happened. And when I read that, I thought, there are things that have happened in our life. And I'd venture to say, for all of you, there are things that have happened in your life that if you look back back on them, you would know there was a God orchestrating events for you. There was something going on beyond you that is just hard to explain. And I'm going to share a few of my stories, our stories, of times when God moved that it was only explained by the fact that we serve a living God who actually looks out for us, knows where we are. And so I want to give some foundation from the Scripture because we could probably spend the rest of the day just quoting verses that relate to the fact that God knows right right where we are. But I'm going to ask Cindy to read just a few of them today. And um, um, Oh, yeah, here you go. The first one is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The second one is Proverbs 16, 33. And I encourage you to jot these down. You can always go back and um, since they're not in PowerPoint today, you can always go back and, and look them up at home. Proverbs 16, 33 in the Amplified says, The lot is cast into the lap, but the decision is holy of the Lord. Even the events that seem accidental are really ordered by him. 1 Corinthians 8.3, New American Standard says, But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. 2 Timothy 2.19, New American Standard says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. <clears throat> Psalm 1.1, the Message Bible says, God charts the road you take. And John 14, 1, or I'm sorry, John 1, 47 through 49 in the Amplified says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said concerning him, See, here's an Israelite indeed, a true descendant of Jacob, 
in whom there is no guile, nor deceit, nor falsehood, nor duplicity. Nathanael said to Jesus, How do you know me? How is it that you know these things about me? Jesus answered him, Before ever Philip called you, when you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Teacher, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Thank you. Thanks. Some of those scriptures just, they still stun me when I hear them today. I think, you know, Nathanael basically said, whoa, this guy knows more about me than he should. And he's like, you're the Messiah, you know, I'm not going to mess with you. I love those little parts of scripture that God charts the road you take. He knows where you're going. He knows where you are. You know, we need to understand that, that he has this plan and that he wants to work that plan in our lives. And, uh, you know, as... Well, I'll say it like this. <laughs> I used to used to think, well, okay, God knows my location. He knows where I am. He's He's involved in what I'm doing, and and I want Him there. And I don't want it to. I, I want to basically obey whatever He wants me to do. I've always lived my life and said, Lord, I just want what You want. Some some of the guys would remember me saying that. That I I just want what the Lord what the Lord wants. That's what I want. I. I don't want anything different than that. And uh, I, when I was when I was preparing this message, I uh, the only thing that came to me was this this really deep spiritual Christmas carol that says, "He sees you when you're sleeping. <laughs> he knows when you're awake. <laughs> he knows when you've been bad or good. So be good, for goodness' sake." Uh, but say that's a prophecy, okay? <laughs> I know that was Santa Claus, but I, you know, I'm telling you that he's, it's much like the Lord. He sees us all the time. And isn't it cool to think he's got a plan. He's figuring this thing out. How can I bless this one? How can I take that couple on a journey that they're going to just love? How can I do that? What can I do for them? And so, you know, I, I have to tell you a little story. Cindy and I lived out on Crestview Road by the high school. Lived out, lived here for 28 years in Columbiana, and uh, we had a nice little farmhouse, one acre of land, and uh, you know we had our four kids there, and the six of us at times struggled with enough money for groceries. I mean, I had okay jobs. I worked hard. It was a hard worker, but I, you know, I wasn't making a ton of money, and I remember. As a young couple, just say, Lord, we just want to we just want to feed our kids good food. We don't we're not asking for steak every night. Just just something nice for our kids. And I I can tell you that um, we prayed. We said, Lord, would you just provide? We don't know how you'll do it, but would you just take care of us? Well, sometimes when we pray like that, <clears throat> the answer comes in ways that we could never imagine. It was a summer morning out on Crestview Road. I remember waking up. My window was up all night, you know, because it was hot. And I hear my dog. I had a Labrador. We named him Kenobi uh, because Star Wars was popular. Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know. So we had our old Labrador Kenobi, and he was a wild Labrador. I mean, he he became an outside dog in his own doghouse because he just he knocked the kids over. He was he was nice, but he was he was rough. So he had a habit of breaking his chain. He would pull that hard on it. Uh, I had him chained to a telephone pole with a big long chain, and I re- still remember there was this path on the outer edge where the chain would reach, and he he would go to the very edge, and you saw this circle of dirt, you know, where where the furthest path was. Well, he would always break the chain. So this morning, <clears throat> I thought, yeah, he's done it again. He's broke his chain. So I, I it's like 7 o'clock. I, I open the curtains. I look out the window. He's right outside my window growling. He has a fox in his mouth, okay? And I didn't even know we had fox around here. I thought, what is going on? My dog has caught a fox. Now, usually my dog would catch a already dead groundhog, 
chew on it for a while, and then smell terrible for the next week. Um, that was typically what would happen. This time, he brings home a fox, and he had obviously uh, killed the fox. I mean, he, it was in his mouth, but it was hanging straight down. It looked like a, a rubber chicken. Every bone was probably broken in this fox's body. Uh, there was no blood, he was just, but he was there. <clears throat> he would drop it, and he would touch it, like, come on, fight some more, you know, and he was, he was fighting this poor little fox, but it, it was dead, and I thought, how am I going to get this fox away from him, I got on some clothes, went outside, <laughs> he was, gonna, was not going to let go, I'm like, I might like hit him in the side, like, let go, finally I got the fox out of his mouth by the tail, and, th- and he's jumping up as high as he can to get the fox, I didn't know what to do, I swung it around, threw it up on my roof. Okay, so the fox is up on my roof. The dog is actually trying to jump up on the roof like he could do that, you know. So I took the dog, took him back to his, his pen, and I tied him up, scared the dog, and I thought, now I got a fox on the roof. What am I going to do with this fox? Got my ladder, got the fox down, and I thought, well, I better go bury this fox. And right at, right at that moment, you know, it was one of those things like, uh, God, would you really speak to me about a fox? But what I heard was, uh, go call John. Well, uh, some of you who have been around Columbia a long time might remember John Cope. Uh, uh, you know, John, and his dad had the furniture, Miller Furniture. and Well, John was a friend, and John and Kathy were coming to the upper room. So I called John, and I said, uh, you're not going to believe this, but I got a fox. My dog brought home a fox. He goes, I know this guy in Columbiana who collects, who deals in pelts. And I don't remember the guy's name. All I know is, John said, let's take the fox to him. So he called the guy. I picked up John. We went, went and dropped off or showed the fox. He looks at it. And he says, wow, that's really something. Your dog caught a fox. It must be a good hunter. I go, yeah, I guess, you know. And so, uh. He says, boy, it's, it's got some punctures in the, in the pelt. But he said, you know, it's not great. It's not perfect. I could, I could only give you about $40 for the, the fox. And I go, oh, no, that'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, 40 is good. You know, and he uh, <clears throat> handed me the money, said thanks. I have no idea what happened to the fox. It was already dead, so I don't know what happened to the fox. I remember holding that money and thinking, Lord, could you somehow be, be doing some creative thing here just to provide a little money? What I did was I uh, took John home. I immediately went to the IGA. In fact, I think in that day it was called Crooks, if you remember Crooks Grocery Store. And uh, I went there, and I spent all $40 on some food for my family. I did buy a boat for the dog, too, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I got $40 worth of food. And, uh, of course, we didn't have cell phones in those days. And uh, I can still remember coming home <laughs> saying, Cindy, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> they gave us $40 for that fox, and I came in with two big bags of groceries. And we just sat there, and, and now, today, what I would say is God, knew our address. He knew right what we needed. Can you imagine, uh, how many of you have ever had your dog catch a fox? Can I see your hands? Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I look at stories like that and I think, you know, it didn't meet all our need, folks. We still had needs. We still needed some more food. We still, you know, a week later with two boys and two girls, I can tell you that we needed more food. But sometimes... All you need is to know that God knows. You you don't need every, you know, you're going through something, you're going through a difficult time, and you're saying, Lord, why is this happening? Show me. Just let me know you're there. And God will do that. And and that's all you need to know. Just uh, a couple months ago, when right after I got home from the hospital from the stroke, I was really asking the Lord that kind of question again. Like, Lord... I just need to know that you know my situation. 
that you, you're still out there and you still speak to me. We were driving, Cindy was driving, I wasn't able to drive yet, and um, we were pretty close to our house. And we were just driving down the road and it was dusk. And I, I, was, I was just thinking, in my thoughts, not thinking about anything in particular. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, tell Cindy to watch out for deer. <laughs> like, Lord, um, I do recognize your voice. We've, we've known each other a long time, and I, I recognize that that's you. So I just said, Cindy, I said, you should slow down and just watch for deer. It's that time of day. Just be careful. <laughs> uh, you know, you might say, oh, that's just the pizza you ate or something like that. No, I heard God saying something like that. So I told her. She slowed the car down. In about another hundred yards, we made a bend in the road, and there were two deer standing right there in the road. Now, we obviously waited for the cross. We were all safe, and everything was good. And you might say, oh, that's cute. For me, that was the Lord saying, Jim, I just gave you a little bit of sign there so that you know I've got you under control. Your life is in my hands. It's going to be okay. So sometimes we don't need the full story. We don't need God to show us every little thing when we're going through something. But he is faithful to give you enough so that you can say, Lord, I know you know, and that's all I needed to hear. I just needed to know that you were aware. And, and that's the kind of God that we have. And so, you know, as I, as I you know, pondered, you know, what to, do, what to do today, what to share, what, to, what things to say to you, I... There's so much more that I could share. I mean, it's a book full of stories, but I am going to tell you one more story. Before I do, I just want to paraphrase the part of Scripture. Remember Abram and Sarah, when God had promised they would have a child. How wonderful it was that God said, Abram, do you see the grains of sand? Your descendants are going to be as many as the grains of sand. Can you count them? Can you count the stars? God gave a wonderful promise, but it hadn't happened. And Abram and Sarah were old. Remember what they did? They tried to help God. And so Sarah said to Abram, I'm going to ask my handmaiden, Hagar, to go in and to uh, be intimate with you. And she'll have a child, and we'll have an heir for the future through her. Well, we know that didn't work out too well. You know, Hagar got pregnant, had Ishmael. If you know history, you know that Ishmael and Israel are still fighting today in a very real way in the Middle East. But what happened at the time was Hagar fleed from the presence of God. She, she left it and said she was found under a tree, and a fig tree, and she was kind of there in her misery thinking, I should just end my life. God came to her. It's a really wonderful story of mercy. God came to her and said, don't worry. I'm going to make of your son a great people also. And it's interesting that when God came and said, I'm going to take care of you, it says she called on the name of the Lord who spoke to her. And she said, you are the God who sees. For she said, have I also, been, have I also seen him who sees me? Therefore, the place was called Beer Lahai Roy. It's a Hebrew words. It says, observe it. It's between Kadesh and Bered. You know, the actual uh, translation of Beer or Beer Lahai Roy is the well of the one who lives and sees me. You are never out of God's sight, ever. Ever, folks. You may think he's far off. But he sees you, and he knows your situation, and he will be there for you. You know, some of you are facing medical things you never thought you would face. I mean, you know, we, look, we honor, we honor Monica today. <laughs> you know, I remember when Monica was walking around. <laughs> I remember those days. But I can tell you this, the God who sees has, has had his eye on her 
from the moment she was formed in her mother's womb. And he has kept his hand upon her life. She's got a family and children. And God's doing great things in her. That's just one small story. We've all got a story, every one of us. Can I tell you one more story? We have, I think we have time for one more story. My, my wife and I were uh, uh, at an anniversary time. I think it was our 30th when we went to Hershey, right? Decided to take my wife to Hershey, Pennsylvania for our anniversary. Men, great idea, Okay. I'm just throwing that out there, the chocolate capital of the world. Take your wife to Hershey, okay? So it was September, our anniversary is September 13th, and decided to go to Hershey. And um, we had done the tours and seen the chocolate factory, and we had, you know, looked at the gardens and done different things and saw the museum and, you know, did all this stuff. And uh, it was actually the day of our anniversary, and we didn't have anything to do, and and uh, so I went and got one of those newspapers that, uh, <clears throat> that has the entertainment section in it, you know, like the Vindicator does. And I'm looking through this thing, like, there's got to be something to do in Hershey. Well, unless you're into chocolate, there's not a whole lot to do in Hershey, okay? <laughs> Sorry. You know, so <clears throat> I'm looking through, and I was kind of disgusted. You know, I was like, I, I admit it. I was like, jeez, there's nothing to do in this town. You know, and I, I, I don't want any more chocolate. It was like, that's it. So I, I threw the paper down on the bed, went to the bathroom, came back, and I, I you know, stretched out on the bed, lay there, and there's this entertainment section. Open up this page, and I read it. It says, contemporary Christian musician Paul Clark playing at Elizabethtown Baptist Church. And I'm thinking, Paul Clark? Paul Clark, some of you remember Paul Clark. Back in the Jesus People days, he played with Phil Kagey and Pete York, and he was, he, he'd been to Columbiana before. Well, Paul had written a song called Let Us Climb the Hill Together, and we played that song in our wedding. When the bridesmaids came down, we, we sang this. I was, I was in a band called Peculiar People. By the way, I saw you did a series called Peculiar People, great choice. <laughs> we had this band, and that was our name, and yeah, it was interesting. But anyway, uh, the guys at the band played that song of Paul's while the girls walked down the aisle, and then my bride came down the aisle. And so Paul was pretty special to us. We never met him. And I'm like, and it was tonight, and we didn't know where Elizabethtown was, Check that, it was only 10 miles away. The concert was that night. I mean, the paper flew open to that page, and I hadn't seen it before. We're going, you don't suppose that would be the Paul Clark, you know? I said, well, maybe. Let's try. So we didn't know how to dress. We didn't know what kind of church it would be. And uh, so we, had, we were pretty casual. And, uh, but we took a change of clothes, and we showed up at this church Pretty early, I think we were the first car in the parking lot. We're like, uh, is this the right place? You know, we waited. We started seeing cars show up, people get out, and they were dressed pretty nice. So I can still remember we, we pulled to the edge of the parking lot, and I remember putting long pants, my, my long pants on in the car, thinking, yeah, we were all underdressed. So we got, we got dressed and changed, went in and said, uh, we like, you know, two tickets. They said, well, it's free, but you do need a ticket. It's like, okay. So they gave us a ticket, and I said to the lady, um, is this, is this Paul Clark, like, how old is he? <laughs> she said, he's pretty old. <laughs> I think he would be, you know, because he was our age. And so I'm sitting here thinking, hmm. Uh, and so I said, well, we're here on vacation, and uh, really here on our anniversary, it's today, and at our wedding 30 years ago, Paul Clark, we sang one of his songs in our wedding when the bridesmaids came down the aisle. And the lady was disinterested. It was like, okay, great, you know. Do you want to take it or not, you know? So 
So, <laughs> thanks. So we, uh, we got our two tickets. We went in, sat, you know, like five, six rows back on the side, trying to look inconspicuous, just still wondering, is this really Paul Clark, you know? So they introduce him, out he comes, sure enough, it's Paul Clark. Still, we, he didn't know us, we didn't know him, just the song. And so after about the fourth song, I think, He's up there, and he goes, I understand there's a couple here tonight celebrating their anniversary. And we're like, oh, my gosh. Or maybe it's somebody else, you know. <laughs> and he said, and I hear that back on their wedding day, they sang one of my songs, you know, during the wedding. And he said, where's that couple? And uh, <laughs> we're like, oh, no. <laughs> so we, like, raise our hands, you know. I was really glad I took my shorts off, put on long pants, you know, and looked a little better. And uh, he said, stand up. So he interviews us in this crowd of 300 people. So what song did I sing? And we told him, and he goes, oh, yeah, well, that's been a long time, you know. And, and he said, so you sang that? He said, and today's your anniversary? We go, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, that's really something. And he goes, what did the two of you come up, come up here? Come on up. We're like, really? So we, want, we knew not one person, not even Paul. We knew not one person in that place. We very cautiously walk up front. He goes, he's on this platform about this high. He says, well, stand right here in front of me and face me. We go, okay. We're looking at him. He goes, so it was, let us climb the hill together. We said, yeah, that was his song. He goes, well. I want to sing that for you today, just, just to bless you. And so we sat there, held hands at this crowd of 300 unknown people, and Paul Clark sang that song from our wedding. Now, do you think God knows your address? I mean, come on. I threw a paper down on the bed. Up comes his name. Doing a concert that night while we're away on our anniversary and sings a song from our wedding day. I remember, I, I remember we, we were like stunned. And we got to, got to know Paul. He's actually stayed in our home several times now. We're good friends. We know him well. And we've, uh, we've since that day, you know, reminisced about... Uh, the, that moment in our life. In fact, he wrote a little bit of the story of what it meant to him in the book. What I'm saying today is probably simpler than, than some messages you've heard. It's, it's this. No matter what you walk through, there is a God who is looking for ways to help you. He's looking for ways to bless you. Believe it. Believe that, that there's, it's like this giant orchestra in heaven. And he's the conductor. And he's up there and he's saying, uh, you know, Tim and Joe and Sandy, today I'm going to do something for you. Be watching. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. That's the kind of God he is. He'll show up. He'll, he'll do something for you. And never think that that the difficulty of your life is unknown to him. Watch for him in the good and the bad. Know this, a loving God. I mean, I've known him since 1969 when I gave my heart to Jesus. I know what he's like. He's like this. He's like when you're having trouble, it breaks his heart, and he wants to help you. You know, uh, when I had the stroke, I remember... Several well-meaning people said, why do you think God gave you a stroke? And I said, God did not give me a stroke. And they said, well, what do you mean? I go, well, look, I know the devil will try to use this. I know also that God will do everything to teach me things through this. But I said, my, my dad died when I was 51 years old of coronary artery disease. My mom lived into her 90s, but it had 15, 20 strokes. My sister is six years older. She's had a stroke. I said, 
If you want to call it bad genes, call it bad genes. But, but we live in a fallen world. You know, I, it's a pet peeve of mine when people blame God when bad things happen to them. <laughs> this is a fallen world. We sin, and with sin, all manner of sickness and disease entered into this place. And so we are suffering from a fallen world, not from a loving God who tries to hurt people. And so get that right. Get your theology straight down here. God does not inflict hurt on his people. He loves his people, and he is there to bless you. And so God's, even, even if the world has junk that happens to you, even if the devil tries to destroy you, never think that God's the one who's up there doing the bad things. God is the one doing the good things. He's the one for you, not against you. And so trust in him in those moments. Find yourself in a place where you're saying, Lord, show me. Show me what you're doing. Show me why, why this is happening. Show me how, what you want to teach me. Ask him all those things. But also, watch for him to just simply bless you. Don't you do that for your kids? I mean, did you ever do that? Like your kids... It, it'd be sad if all the good things you do for your children, they feel that you've done it because they already did something good themselves, so you're just paying them back. No, man, I, I do good things for my kids whether they deserve it or not because they're my children. We should be, that's, that's what our Lord is like. I hope I don't mess with your theology there, but if you walk around blaming God for all the bad things that happen to you, uh, can you imagine if you blamed your wife for every problem you have? She's not, she's not a fault. Don't even think about doing that. So uh, let me wrap this up by just simply saying, reflect on your life a little bit today. Think about those moments in your life when God absolutely orchestrated events. No doubt about it. Let that build your faith to know that he's real, that he loves you. He cares for you. He's got, he's got things going on, you know. He's probably, he's probably strategizing right now for some way to bless you in the weeks to come. Look for that. Think about that. Ponder that. And then even if uh, difficult times come, don't blame him, but look for him to give you strength in the midst of it. You know, we're not promised an easy life. Richard Lambert, you know, who made dozens of visits here, to the upper room and prophesied over 90% of the crowd those days. He came in with braces on his legs. He came in having to take medication just to get out of bed. He had myasthenia gravis, but you never knew that. He simply came and served God. He, and he never, he never, I never once heard him whine about it and complain about it, but he shared some words to some of you in this room that changed your life. You know, we need to, we need to remember Unfortunately, as a culture, it's the last thing I'll say about this whole, this whole area. As a culture, we tend to be people who need to blame somebody for everything. And it's a shame. It's just a shame. And many times God gets blamed for things he never did. And so let's, let's be a people that are more gracious, more kind, and then a people who really look for those moments where God simply takes time to do some good things for us. Wouldn't it be wonderful? I mean, honestly, some of our mindset is, well, you know, like what our parents said to us, like, well, if one bad thing happens, they happen in threes. You know, probably two more bad things are going to happen before something. Like, that's garbage. That's, that's fortune telling. That's, that's not my king. I mean, we serve a risen Savior. He's alive and well, and he's looking for ways to bless us. So uh, I hope this makes sense through the hoarseness of my voice and the difficulty of getting the words out. I hope that uh, you're hearing from a guy who's very grateful to be alive, very thankful that my king kept his hand on me and that you didn't have to just read the book and go, oh, yeah, Jim was a wonderful guy. Come on. You know, I'm glad to be alive. I'm glad to be here, being able to walk. And, and uh, it may not be, be pretty, but 
I'm thankful the Lord's hand has been upon me. Be grateful for all the things he's given you. And, and if you're going through difficulties, look for him to do good things for you, to take care of you, to watch over you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask Chuck to come and uh, uh, close us out. I, I will tell you that I know the book is out there, and I'll be glad to sign it. I will say this. Uh, my signature is not that pretty these days after the stroke, but I will sign your book for you. So, uh, let me turn things over, Chuck. Thank you, everybody, so much.